thank you guys so much for we're still adjusting for joining us this evening i'm so we are so honored to have all of you on panel uh tonight and can we just clap it up for Joel Hall, please? Yes. Yes. He's like the world. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Hey. Good evening. Thank you guys so much for just for joining us this you, evening. You are, um, um, we are so honored to have all of you on okay. now. Uh, okay. Dr. OB. Can we get back up the goal all the time? Yes. Hello. Hello, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you guys so much for okay. Closure OB for joining us this evening. We are um, we're so honored to have all of you on okay. now. Um, Closure OB. Can we get back up the goal all the time? so much again we're so excited um and also i think i think we're dealing with two different emotions i think everybody is right now with and if i'm looking over here i'm talking to my sidekick kwame abdul bay <laughs> he's feed me information he'll be working with me with panel questions and things like that um i just want to say we are again i think we're all toiling with different emotions. We are happy and excited and um, just really grateful for you, Joel. Jewel, is it Jewel? It's Jewel. Jewel, for you, Jewel, for you. you know your success and, um, and happy you. that you're with us tonight. And we're in, and everybody, each and every one of you, but we're also toiling with our emotions brimming to the full right now with what's happening in our country and i just wanted to for us to just do just a few minutes of silence yes. for the lives taken uh the murders the racial violence and the murders that have gone on in our country that has this has all of us um very sad right now and just very sick to our stomachs and in it in our spirits for what's happening And if you want to take a deep breath and blow it out, you can. And let's just release it. <clears throat> yeah. Release it. And um, and I would I would like um, at the end of this, we have some reverends on the call. We have President Green and we have Anika Whitfield <laughs> on our call, Dr. Anika Whitfield on our call. And I would and I want to, if I can remember, you guys remind me to have each of you. And if Jewel, if you and Ruby, Ruby, you can't hear me. Can you hear me, Ruby? I would like. It's like doing um, a double take. Oh, is you're still yeah, recording? Are you? Do you still have your OB open? Uh, we have President yes. Green and we have Anika Whitfield. So you got to close out of it. Call Dr. Anika okay. Whitfield on a call, and I would, and I want to, if I can remember, you guys remind me to have each of you. Okay. All right. Sounds like you got it. Uh, to have each of you and Ruby, if you would like to, and Jewel, if you would like to say a, a close, you know, say a little prayer for our country, for our community, uh, please do. Uh, and again, I would like for you all to do that if you would like to. Um, so, if you would, because we have, I know Dr. Uh, Whitfield, you have. Uh, 
responsibility at 7 p.m. What time is it? It's 7 right now. She's outside. It's at 7 30. It's at 7 30. 7 30. So she's she's committed to, you know, she has things in her yard, Black Lives Matter. She's playing music. Uh, Janelle Monet, hell you talking about, you know, just kind of protesting what's happening right now. And so we got we're gonna respect that. Uh, for her being, you know, the the activist and organizer that she is, and <coughs> anyone else who has something, so we're gonna ask questions and and just ask you to give a, a short, abridged answer to them, um, because we have more panelists this time, and just in respect for time. So I would like to uh, just, President Green, you were on last um, session uh, or last. Uh, Sunday with Mr. Wesley, um, what's Wesley's last name? Ooh, I believe it was Cams. Kane, Wesley Kane. And he was an 09 graduate of Bards College. And we really enjoy Wesley being with us. So we, we definitely clap it up and cheer for Wesley and everything that he has going for him and his success. Uh, President Green of Shorter College, you're doing great things. You are uh, over the the um, education um, program, the prison education program for Shorter College, and you're over the all of them in Arkansas, correct? Well, uh, Arkansas State University okay. uh, at Newport mm -hmm. has a um, uh, serves one unit at Newport. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe that they have between maybe 25 and 50 students there. Uh, but uh, Shorter College operates at eight uh, facilities uh, around the state. Uh, and uh, the state has requested uh, that we increase uh, that number to include uh, three work release centers. Uh, so we haven't yet uh, done that. Uh, but uh, assuming that we're able to do that in, uh, in, within the next year, we would operate at 11 uh, locations across the state. And thank you. Ser serving up between four and, and up to 500 students. We're authorized to, to serve 500. Right now we have between three and 400. Awesome. Yes, that is wonderful. And that's really great to hear. And I'm, I'm so... Uh, happy to hear and that's going still going on from what we talked about last week that's still happening right now correct it hasn't shut down because of COVID-19 uh, no uh, not yet uh, we are very um, grateful and uh, as I said last week uh, we have to um, uh, take our hats off to the state of Arkansas and um, the correction officials um, uh, from the governor on down, uh, because the easiest thing to do uh, under the COVID-19 pandemic situation uh, is to shut it down, uh, to isolate uh, that population uh, from access to anybody on the outside uh, who doesn't have to come into the prison, coming in, possibly introducing uh, the virus uh, to the population. Uh, so we are being allowed to use, uh, to continue the program using alternative methods of instruction. Uh, and uh, that's a bit cumbersome, uh, but uh, we are able to carry on. And so we're very, we're very happy uh, about that. Yes, and we're very happy about that also. So thank you so very much, Anika. I know we're gonna we're gonna shoot it to you because of your time uh, constraints. What is the Poor People's Campaign? I know you guys are doing a lot, mm -hmm. um, but in Arkansas, how have you been able to um, help with you? You help with so many things um, with uh, the um, economic issues that go on in the community, food uh, security issues that go on in the, com in the community, um, just, uh, just the whole gamut, the Poor People's Campaign deals with multi-level issues in the community. As it relates to incarceration, what is the Poor People's Campaign in Arkansas able to do 
um, especially now during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Well, you know, the um, thank you so much, Clarice and Kwame. Welcome. And I'm glad to uh, be on this panel. So I want to thank you all and, and thank you for indulging me because I will be stepping away at 7.30 if it's okay <laughs> so I can um, help to lead um, our voices in the community uh, as, as it relates to Black Lives Matter. Uh, we recognize in neighborhoods and communities, a lot of people are sheltering in place mm -hmm. uh, and some people really are not comfortable being out in crowds. I still haven't been able to open up my private practice because I'm in a building with eight floors of physicians and, and labs and so it's difficult for me to understand how I can really make my staff as well as my patients stay safe coming to see me. Um, and anyway, that's kind of a sidebar, but I wanna say that with the Poor People's Campaign, it's a movement. Uh, we, Reverend Barbara often says we are an organism. And so we're an organism that's connected uh, with so many organizations. And so Decarcerate is one of those organizations, um, the Arkansas Coalition to um, Abolish the Death Penalty. Yes. Um, Ruby's uh, uh, Felon is a, a part of the movement as well. And so through those organizations, we are able to um, connect with people that are currently either being incarcerated or persons who are being detained as well. And so we've been blessed to have an opportunity to uh, connect with people to find out um, what is going on on the inside. Uh, we've connected with family members who have experienced uh, the travesty of this COVID-19 uh, as it relates to um, what we consider to be our state's negligence. Um, and so we are calling that out um, because uh, we're, we're hearing the reportings on a, a daily basis, Monday through Friday, about uh, what the uh, cases or the persons who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 are and the way that it's presented to community is that they're two different communities. Mm -hmm. um, our, our governor suggests that um, people that are in state uh, prisons and people that are being detained in jails are in one community and everybody else is in another community. And, and we denounce that. Um, if you live in Arkansas, you are an Arkansan. And this is impacting the family. This is impacting the state. And so we are going to start addressing that issue. Um, and uh, we're helping to lift out and amplify the, the stories of persons who are directly impacted. Again, I was just lifting up Ruby, who's coming back on. She was yeah. able to help us to connect with some family members of people who have been directly impacted. In fact, uh, we spoke with a mother on yesterday and a daughter who um, have been directly impacted and, and we want them to tell their own stories. We don't wanna tell their stories, yeah. uh, but we wanna stand in solidarity. And we recognize, um, um, unfortunately, that the state has taken such an aback uh, position uh, that they, they have been so callous in the way that they have handled uh, even acknowledging to family members that their family members have COVID-19 or that their family members have been tested with it. Uh, and so we call out that immoral behavior and we recognize that um, we our voices can't afford to be silent mm -hmm. because we have brothers and sisters, we have mothers and fathers who are incarcerated because the system has chosen to put them there, uh, has chosen to say that we're gonna take care of you, but they're not taking care of our family members and we're gonna call that out. So um, so that's, that's some of the things that we've been doing. Um, policy, because a lot of these organizations uh, directly work with policy, um, you know, we co-sign those things that are in alignment with ending systemic poverty, ending systemic racism, ending this war economy that's tied with this criminal injustice system, mm -hmm. uh, ending the distorted and immoral narratives that divide us, and ending ecological devastation. And so when, when those things rise up in community, we are there to help move that along and help to amplify that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anika. I know the work that you do with the Poor People's Campaign, with other organizations uh, in education, Grassroots Arkansas and other organizations. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing right now, especially in this pandemic. Um, and whenever you need to leave, just cut, you know, just let me know and then we'll just <coughs> say goodbye to you. Um, Ruby, yay, we got Ruby back. Hi, Ruby. Unmute your, unmute your screen. Unmute your mic.
Let me see. I think I can unmute you. I got yeah. it. Okay. okay. There you go. I didn't know. I don't know what happened. So I've got, <laughs> I've, got my, I've got I've got three phones. So I was like, okay, let me go on my phone because I could see you guys, but I knew I was I knew you couldn't see me. Business woman. I know you have a lot going on, Ruby. I know you do, especially now. Ruby, can you just tell us about Felon and tell us a little a little more, you know, a little information about you know your organization that you founded and what you're doing right now especially now in this pandemic uh well like i always open up my name is ruby welch uh i'm also known to the state of arkansas it's inmate 706-416 i served seven years five months and six days in the arkansas department of corrections for possession of intent to deliver um while i was incarcerated you know i saw women constantly coming back uh, I never have used drugs. Um, I sold drugs. And so it, it grieved me to see that women were trapped in a cycle that they didn't know how to get out of because of their addiction. Uh, and I also lived with a husband who was addicted um, to cocaine and heroin. And so I kind of had, you know, uh, a little bit of knowledge from him how to deal with the women. So I purposed them when I came home to start helping women. So that's what felon is. And felon stands for formerly incarcerated, empowered leaders overcoming negative stigmas. Because, you know, when you're in prison, you hear a lot of things that, you know, oh, when you go home, you can't do this, you can't do that. You can't. Mm -hmm. And I've always worked in the medical field, but I had my, I went back to, I have my cosmetology license, which lapsed while I was in prison. So I went back to school in prison and was able to get my cosmetology license activated before I came home. Um, and I just came home with, with a passion to help other women not to return back to the incarceration system. Mm -hmm. So I started taking uh, classes because I'm not going to go to college right now, you guys. I'm going to wait till next year. I'll be 60 and I can go for free. Yes, uh, that's so, right. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I take, I do certificates. <laughs> so that's what I do. I, I get different certificates. So uh, right now I'm employed with... Um, UAMS as a community health coordinator, and I actually educate uh, on HIV and PrEP uh, within the um, county jails. But I also, on Tuesdays, whenever we open back up, I go, um, and that's where Felon comes into forces at um, the Wrightsville unit. I speak with the men. Um, my uh, Felon has a 10 step program that's called Healing His Heart. Uh, so I allow the men to ask me questions from a woman's perspective of what we expect out of men. And then I allow them to ask me what do women expect out of, out of, out of women. And so I just kind of let them use me with my transparency. And right now, as um, Dr. Nika said, you know, we're working on um, the COVID in the Cummins unit. Uh, right. Um, can't speak a lot about it, but right yeah. now we are working on some things that... Um, Mm -hmm. We are trying to uh, track the data uh, of people that are coming out of prison for the sole purpose. If you can let people out because of a pandemic, because the, their crimes are, are, are nonviolent and non-sexual, well, why do you have them in prison in the first place? Right. So right. those are the things right. that I do. So I, and I, I tr attempt to put people on policy as much as they'll allow me, but um, that's my desire. Um, I'm the Arkansas ambassador for Cut 50. Uh, I worked on the dignity bill for incarcerated women because I myself suffered in prison with some uh, female issues that um, they didn't address and I almost died. Uh, so dignity for incarcerated women, um, that bill passed last year and was mm -hmm. signed uh, into law April the 8th of 2019. Okay. And the greatest thing about it is now in prisons, instead of them um, calling the women inmate welch or inmate whitfield or inmate green they now call them miss yes and that's so right that's they're making awesome thank you thank you thank so you much you are amazing and we are so honored to have you thank you so very much for all of that great information and wow. i've already told everybody that was listening and we will um after this we'll make sure that everyone has all of you, your information to contact you, any of you, uh, to follow up and to get more information about your organizations and how they can be active and also support and help. Jewel, 
Whoa. Do you know that you are my birthday twin? Oh, really? Yes. I found oh. that out watching College Behind Bars 3, part oh. three, and you said November 8th, yes. it's my birthday, and you were in the kitchen with your mom, and I was like, oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> <laughs> You are my birthday twin, my brother. Yes. Man, <laughs> I found you. <laughs> That's beautiful. Oh so, my God, it really is. So, um, so somebody, okay, so okay. You, your microphone, Ruby, I think. It's me. <laughs> Thank you. Jewel, now tell us. Okay, so I saw a lot of debate teams and different things in there. Were you ever on the debate team? Were you even interested in that? No, I wasn't on the actual debate team, the, the official debate team, but I would say that the BPI community has a tradition of being argumentative and debative with each other. So we, we planted the seed and I'm so happy to see that it grew into an official debate, debate team. So. Yeah, that's so awesome. I love that. I'm, I'm very fascinated in reading your papers. I saw they had a whole book of your work in the BPI library. And I was like, I got to get that. Because you were doing a paper on, you were in German studies, right? Yes. And you were doing, what was your paper about exactly? My paper explored the ways in which uh, Germany as a nation uh, transformed the nation through the migrant worker program. Uh, it okay. covered a period of history from the 1954 to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1980, in which the Germans considered itself a multicultural society early on because of the migrants, mm. but eventually became uh, a bit, uh, I, wanna, I don't want to say racist, but that's, you got to call it what it is. Well, they did, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the 1980s saying all migrants need to leave the country. Oh, wow. How can we, because a, a lot of us, a few of us on panel were saying, we need those papers, like we need to be able to read them. How can we get copies of those? Well, I'm more than willing to send a copy of myself. I, you know, I have one. I'm not sure the official way to get it through the uh, college. Mm. I'm sure there's a way. I'm not familiar with it, but if you contact me at my email, I'll be yes. more than happy. Yeah. Awesome. That would be awesome. And then I will. I anybody, anyone else who would like it, I will. Okay, we'll definitely distribute it so we can all read it and, and send you some good feedback on our thoughts. <laughs> we have a question from the audience uh, or listeners her, by Joyce. Joyce would like to know, thank you, Joyce. Uh, she wants to know, please, she wants to know from you, oh, the, the normal thing. People would like for you to say something in German. <laughs> I know you get this all the time. Yes, all the time. Ich kann uh, ein bisschen German sprechen, aber meine Deutsche nicht so gut. I, I can't go. You know, my mind is. What does in that America. mean, Jewel? I basically <laughs> said I can speak German, but my German is not that good now. So okay. <laughs> okay. I have to get it back. <laughs> and she also wanted to know why German studies? So this started actually from a challenge from a professor. I took a German uh, literature class in translation with maybe uh, Wesley Keynes was in the class as well, of about five other students. And what happened was we criticized. We had the, the audacity to criticize the translation in English. And the professor <laughs> challenged us. He said, hey, I teach German language. If you take the class, maybe you could read and tell me if it's really a good translation. And that just turned into a love for the culture and the language in about eight years of studying German. Wow, that is amazing. So you cannot let that go rusty. You got to keep that going. <laughs> you got to keep that Because there's not many people here who speak, so. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Are you in German chat groups and stuff like that to kind of yes, stay? Yes. And I surprisingly can uh, still understand it when I'm on a train uh, in New York you know, there's a lot of people traveling from Germany by JFK. And, you know, I, they don't know that I understand their conversations. So. Oh, yeah. Isn't that something? <laughs> Do you say anything whenever you catch them saying something? Maybe? No. Not a word. 
Yes. Kwame yes. made a statement. He said you should work for the United Nations. Yes, you know, actually I've met someone who uh, made a connection for me to the uh, translation program at the United Nations. But I must say that right now I'm like really passionate about philanthropy and social justice. Yes. So I'm so caught up in that, but I'll definitely look into it. So speak, speaking of philanthropy and um, social justice, you work at the Ford Foundation, correct? What, what are you guys doing now to, to change, or the, the, the popular term now, to pivot in COVID-19 pandemic? What are you doing now in, in your, um, your area? Yeah, this, this falls, uh, you know, predominantly in our area in relation to the uh, incarceration, incarcerated population. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I'm so proud. I'm so happy to be there. I'm so proud of the leadership of Darren Walker and my director, Tanya Koch, who are really active in changing the grants from just uh, what's called restricted grants for specific programs in organizations to making grants more general so that you know organizations can have access to funds during the pandemic. Uh, we have leveraged our uh, name and our prestige to lean on the governor to support many measures of you know uh, providing funds to people who are released and uh, assuring that there's housing for people who are released. You know, so I'm so proud that you know the Ford Foundation has really stepped to the plate for not only the organization but its employees. A, a week before New York really uh, flared up as a result of the plant pandemic, uh, we had the order to stay at home and to work from home. So, you know, I really see the, the Ford Foundation as being a leader in trying to uh, engage the, the issues, not only of people who are incarcerated, but of immigrants and women and, you know, other people who are impacted by the pandemic. Mm, yes. Awesome. That is, that's awesome. Thank you for your work. Thank you for what you're doing at the Ford Foundation. And, and I'm just really very excited for you that you, I know we were watching the the movie, and I wanted to ask this. I know we we talked about this um, last Sunday with Wesley, and we talked about how what what is what should the function of prison be in society? The, and function, I, the function of prison should absolutely be rehabilitation. The problem is is that there's policies that intertwine rehabilitation with punishment and uh, prevention. So, you know, I think when you have a space where people are concerned about the rehabilitation of individuals, we can see a different uh, 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 view of prisoners in society. Right now, there's, I mean, there's a lot of growth. I'm so impressed with the, the, the changing that is occurring in relation to the views of prisoners, but nonetheless, we haven't really engaged what are prison for. And that's one of the things that College Behind Bars seek to have people think about what could we be doing with this space of men and women who are really yearning to have a different life and change their lives. Mm -hmm. So I really, you know, simply said rehabilitation should be the, the major factor because I think it leads to prevention and people come home and, and contribute to society rather than being all uh, dependent on society. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, Ruby, I want you to answer the same question, but I, I, I want to hear from President Green really quickly about, um, I know you, you all know you are doing it. You, you are helping out with uh, the uh, education in, in prison and the incarceration uh, programs. What else do you think um, the function of prison should be, President Green? Well, I, I believe uh, you asked that question last week. And I uh, want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my answer this week is pretty much the same as it was last week. And, and that is, uh, I'm the president of college. Mm -hmm. And uh, my business is to do what Bard uh, did for those young men and women. Uh, who were given an opportunity while they were incarcerated to transform them 
from who they were to who they could be. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm much more comfortable talking about moving these people uh, to a higher place uh, intellectually mm -hmm. uh, uh, than, than I am in talking about uh, dealing with the corrections uh, uh, system mm -hmm. uh, in our country. Uh, uh, certainly, I agree uh, with, I think, most of our scholars mm -hmm. uh, who have talked uh, it, during current times that mass incarceration uh, is a problem. Uh, and obviously, there are some things that have to do with mass incarceration that have nothing to do with the system of corrections. Mm -hmm. they, it, it has to do with uh, structural uh, mm -hmm. racism and yeah. institutionalized uh, poverty mm -hmm. and uh, lack of education. Uh, so uh, from my standpoint, uh, it's much easier for me to talk about not creating a class of people who will end up in prison mm -hmm. uh, in the first place uh, than it is to talk about how to run a prison, if, okay. if, if, if I'm, if I'm uh, making myself clear. Oh, but it makes perfect sense. You're, you're doing preventative education or preventive, taking the, the front end preventative measures to keep from having to uh, have students or uh, to go to either either go to prison or uh, while they're there to make sure that they're educated to keep the recidivism rate from happening or the recid recidivism from happening uh, in their lives once they're released from prison. Correct? Well, if, if I might just add to that. Yes, sir. One of the young ladies who was in the film uh, when she graduated uh, talked about going home. Yeah. But she defined the going home not as returning to the geographical and physical location mm -hmm. uh, that she came from. Uh, she defined going home as uh, being a choice, having a choice. Yes. Uh, and what most of their stories uh, reveal is that they were not in, con before prison, they were not in control of their destinies. Mm -hmm. uh, that they were uh, being carried along uh, by life, by economics, by situations, uh, they were not empowered mm -hmm. uh, to be able to have choices. Yeah. And I have students uh, talk to me all the time, not just incarcerated students, mm -hmm. uh, but students that we have on campus because we have an open admissions uh, uh, enrollment. And so many of our students have come from disadvantaged backgrounds and uh, they're the same people who are in prison. Uh, they just stopped by short of college uh, and took a detour so that they didn't have to go. And, uh, and so they talk to uh, me uh, and our faculty and our staff about choices. And many of them have not felt that they had uh, the choices even to be moral, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, uh, that they had to, in other words, we had to do what we had to do. Well, uh, uh, and of course, it resulted in a bad choice, uh, but you make bad choices when you don't know what all of your alternatives are. Uh, and so education is very important. Uh, but also economics plays a part in, um, in having latitude uh, to just find yourself in one place or find yourself in another. Uh, so uh, all of us should be working on um, what we're doing with our economy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what choices people have, uh, how people uh, live. Yes, thank you. Ruby, 
what should the function of prison be in society to you? I know right now that you are doing multiple things to, uh, to let the prison system, the whole world know pretty much what the function of prison should be in society. And um, would just love to hear, you said, you, said, uh, um, you said a lot of things when you first started about your organization, but what, what do you say to that question? What is and, what and question be? One of the things that I have really, really pushed uh, whenever I go before any of the legislatures, um, because you know I do get a chance to be the voice for the voices, is that rehabilitation does not begin once the person gets to the state facility or the federal facility. Mm -hmm. It begins day that they come inside your county jail. Yeah. That's, the, that's, that's the main thing. That's where the correction has to begin then. So there, I mean, because there are some people that are sitting there for three months, six months, a year, two years. And so what are you doing with all your time while you're sitting there? Mm -hmm. And one thing that I know for a fact, uh, especially when it comes to women, um, our anger, uh, most women that have been incarcerated, I'm, I'm going to speak from a personal point, me, myself and I, um, my anger, I use as my power, uh, because of all the things that had happened in my past, mm. um, not knowing who I could go to, who I could, who I could talk with. And then even, uh, when I got to prison, you know, six months before I went to prison, my husband was killed by his best friend. And so we're talking about, uh, I've, I've gone without a lot of mental health that I've, I've needed, uh, since I was the age of eight, uh, and I didn't enter prison until I was 37. Um, so we're, we're talking about years. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we need to be able to train the women. Like what I do with the healing her heart part of felon is not only do I allow the mothers to come in, if they have daughters, I have them bring the daughters in. Mm -hmm. Because there are certain things that we need to talk about uh, and be open and honest and transparent, you know, as far as, you know, like the first thing I make sure that, you know, I let, I talk to the mothers first and I let them know, which just about everybody knows my story by now, that um, I was molested by a deacon in church when I was eight years old. Well, I, I suppressed that for years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, like I said, my anger became my power, you know, um, and hurting people hurt people. Mm -hmm. uh, I started selling drugs because, you know, my husband used them. I was like, well, I'll be able to make some money at least, you know, and he, he can't, he can't, you know, smoke it all up or he can't shoot it all up. And so there, there's a lot of things that contribute, but I want to thank you, um, President Green, um, for what you're doing at Shorter, because a lot of the women that I saw walk um, the stage uh, at your graduation, I was actually incarcerated with those women. Um, and I, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm on Facebook with them and even some of the ladies that were, were on this college behind the bars, um, because I'm asked, also a member of the National Council of Women Incarcerated, Incarcerated Women and Girls. So, you know, I've, I've, I've come to New York, I've spoken at Columbia University, and these are the doors that have been open, but not only do we need people with degrees, um, standing before people and educating them, you know, like on some of your classes, it would, it would be so great to have a formerly incarcerated person who is, is doing the right thing, who is walking that walk, who has mapped it out because I'm 14 years out August the 31st of this year, but I'm still on parole. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what you got one slip and I could go back. So how am I able to contain myself now when I couldn't, in 1996, because it was in prison that I found my freedom. Mm. And, and, and it was a freedom to know that I did have a choice. Like, like the young lady said, it, it, I have a choice. You know, even right now, you know, I don't allow people to dictate my life. I will listen to Ms. Ms. Clarice, I'll listen to you, I'll listen to Mr. Joe, because I'll listen to people who are making sound reasoning and advices and steps in their life. But if you see somebody going down the right road, that's what we need to start directing them right now, even as children, mm -hmm. you know, our, our eight year or nine year olds, because they're being exposed to so much by um, social media. Yes. I mean, it's okay to talk to them about certain things because guess what? 
they understand better than you think they do. They really do. And so if we don't do it, now I, I choose to work on the preventative end because it's hard um, working on um, restorative um, and the criminal justice side, because if you ask me personally, um, the whole criminal justice system needs to be torn down and rebuilt mm -hmm. because it, it, it's made for failure. It's made for failure. It, yeah. it's, it, they call it a correctional facility, but what are you correcting? How do you know who needs correction on mental issues? Mm -hmm. How do you know who needs correction on drug addictions? How do you know who needs correction on mommy, daddy issues? How do you know? Right. Because no one is having those conversations individually with people when they go to prison. That's why it needs to start at the county jail so you can get a social worker. Yeah. Uh, right then and there, because I believe that every every state should have some type of diversion program. Yes. And, and, and that's why I wanna, I'm gonna definitely connect with uh, President Green, because that's one of the things that uh, I believe that we should be able to connect with and do something with uh, the young ladies that are going into incarceration in the county jail, uh, who because they do keep in contact with me because I keep in contact with them but to direct them, you know, I mean, like I said, I'll be 59 next Sunday, but you know, they're younger than me. And so I want them to direct them, go to school. Yeah. You know, I fill your mind with something positive and, and just knowing that I have a connection, then, then you're like my resource because that's all I am really with doing with fellas, you know, uh, not only, but I'm a resource, mm -hmm. you know, I people walk a path that I had to walk out on my own in 2006 when I got out of prison because there was no Obamacare. Right. You know, I couldn't get insurance. The, the, uh, the HOPE Act wasn't in, in, um, in law. So I worked on laws as far as the food stamp law, if you had a drug charge where we could get food stamps. Uh, housing, if your charges are three years old, they can't deny you housing. Um, and then the dignity bill. I mean, so I work from a perspective of what <coughs> And what is still taking me because I'm not completed yet. Like I said, I'm still on parole, so I'm still trying to get my clemency so I can be totally free because I want to vote. You know, that's that's where my greatest voice is going to be, and then to be able to tell other men and women right. how to go voting and clemency. But I just want to thank you, thank you, Mr. Jewel, for the work you do. Thank you, Miss Clarice. I just I love you. You know, I love you. Well, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Yes. Uh, you see me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited for this network connection. I am. I really am. This is going to be so great. It, I'm so happy for this. I I love you too, Ruby. And I really, like I said, we we just truly honor and appreciate you and everything that you have gone through and what you have to offer um, us right now. Um, what I'm hearing from everybody is pretty much if I could sum it up in what I think it is that prison should have in place all of these different uh, wraparound services that need to be and should be available to incarcerated persons and people who come in because you're not you're not going in there because you just know everything and that life was so easy and you had this great life and situations then come up and get you caught up. Something happened for you to go there. And so we need to be taken, and for me, I think we need to take stock and really pay attention to, okay, if you know something happened, we need to be able to bring bring people in and talk to them and counsel them and provide them services or even provide their family services. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of things I, I've worked with uh, food, uh, food insecurity in the state of Arkansas. And, you know, we 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 talk to children. We, we know that children need to eat and one out of four children in the state. One out of three, one out of four children in the state go to, go to bed hungry, right? Uh, don't really know where their food is coming from. And we give students backpacks or, you know, whatever. We give them little things of food. 
but we don't think about when they go to school what else are we doing like what are their what's their mother going through what their parents going through what what are their families going through that this child is not eating right so i think that that those those type of services are badly needed and then if we could show some compassion and empathy that you know a lot of what we have to fight through right now in prison and being rehabilitated uh, would not be so hard and we wouldn't see these high recidivism rates so that's my soapbox yes yes jewel if i could just add you know one of the Absolutely. things we're, we're engaging as well is the need for these services in the communities before people yes. are incarcerated yes. yes one of the things that i think college behind bar suddenly uh, points to is the fact that a lot of the guys that tell their stories wanted education but we were in systems that didn't provide us with education. So I'm a staunch advocate for college and prison, but yeah. I also recognize the, I, the fact that it, particularly in my life, mm -hmm. if I was provided with access to these higher educational services early on, maybe I wouldn't have never landed in prison. So yeah, I like exactly. to you know, also keep the focus on communities and the fact that these communities are hurting. I came from Brownsville, Brooklyn and New York, which is still, considered one of the most violent neighborhoods in New York City. Right. So right. we kind of like, you know, at the Ford Foundation, we have this saying, you can either stop the drip from the faucet or get it when it's spilling out, you know? So we would like to stop that drip from the faucet. Yes. I think yes. that would be a, 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 a impactful thing as well. Absolutely. You are so right. I have that's a... one... Go ahead. That's one throw this at you real quick, Mr. Jones. That's one of the things that um, I'm actually working on right now uh, with a doctor that's in California that's getting to move to Arkansas, is to put um, a one-stop shop in a building uh, for people that, that are coming out of incarceration, but to also allow people that are in the community, and I want it to be in the community. I don't want it way out on Chanel. I want it in the, the community. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, people would be able to get get driver's license, social security, insurance. Um, they would have knowledge of the laws because there's people there um, to be able to 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 um, explain everything to them. The the doctor is a holistic uh, physician, so they're gonna you know teach people that how to enjoy nature, appreciate your body, appreciate your spirit, man. And I'm just I'm excited. I, I, I the COVID has slowed me down on so many things because. I was coming for you, President Green. But, uh, <laughs> that's why I'm just letting you know right now that yes, I was because you were already on my list. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of things that we have to have to do in Arkansas, but the main thing that we have to do is start making people um, step up to the plate and quit always wanting to just sit at a table and talk about. It. Okay, my mouth do so much but now it's time to use your feet and your hands right absolutely absolutely we, we we're tired of having meetings about a meeting we really want to be talking about some real things and getting some real real movement going right we all know about that we have two questions from the listening audience uh talk about the one question from joyce again thank you joyce talk about the dichotomy of operating in two worlds as an incarcerated student Mm. So that's so wonderful because we in BPI and my classmates and my cohort really emphasize this notion that when you're in the classroom, you're a student, you're not a prisoner. We're not here recreating the norms and values that people have in the yard. You're here as a student. That means there's a, a level of expectation of you to have read the material and to come to class prepared and to do the work. You know, uh, there's really no excuse. Uh, and particularly because we also emphasize we are here to help each other. So, you know, it's interesting that it is a dichotomy, but I wanna say that if it's done right, it destroys the di dichotomy because like the film shows, it spills back out into the yard into the mm -hmm. recreation areas, yes. into cell blocks, guys asking us for mm -hmm. books, 
guys asking us, hey, can you help me write this letter? Or guys asking us, hey, how can I get into the college program? Yeah. So one of the dichotomies that we definitely emphasize is that, you know, you was accepted into this program and, and you really need to start looking at yourself as a student and not just a prisoner in a, in a prison. I really, really love the uh, cohort family connection that you have. Do you still, I asked, I asked Wesley this uh, last Sunday, do you still talk with your cohorts and your, your family? Do you still talk with them, your bars, bars family? Yes, I want to say they are the way in which we all make sense of this society. <laughs> where oh, yes. Hey. Yes. Because it's, it's so amazing. Look, we're on isolation. And, I, you know, sometimes I have to, you know, it's a good thing, but I have to check myself and say, wait a minute, I'm not in prison. I'm doing my push ups in my living room and yeah. you know, getting right back into that flow. So, you know, this speaks to how, you know, I love this saying by an organization, Just Leadership USA, that people closest to the problem are also closest to the solution, you know? So yeah. if you look at, you know, this whole COVID-19 and, you know, how you have to be so socially isolated and the differences between a, a official lockdown in a prison and the lockdowns we're experiencing outside, we have experts who could, you know, really uh, speak to that. So, yeah. you know, I just want to say that that's one of the things that I uh, love about my cohort is that we have a strong connection out here and it's not just in New York City. It spans the United States as well as globally. We have people in Spain and different countries who unfortunately were dep deported, but took the program and we all stay in connection. That is so wonderful, Jewel. It really is. I think that's beautiful. And I think we could all stand to learn so much, mm -hmm. so much, especially during this time on, you know, how to, you need to be, I think, are you doing any talks or any YouTube videos or anything? I, I read your article about the COVID-19 piece that you did along with another, uh, I think she was, was she a reporter or was she the? The director, Lynn Director, yeah. yes. And are you doing any lives or any type of trainings um, other than just, you know, writing re like reviews or reports or? You know, my activism has been uh, tempered by mob. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, you know, and I, I get satisfaction for my job because I'm dealing with these issues through work, but um, I do speak frequently. Um, not as much as I like, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in uh, schools. In fact, I'm uh, speaking at a, a high school yeah. on Wednesday to, some, to the youth. And, you yeah. know, I, I spoke uh, maybe two weeks ago, a week ago, uh, virtually to uh, brothers inside of Mecklenburg Correctional uh, County Jail in uh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So just say shortly, I would love to do more, but you know, I have to balance a few of the demands that I have in my life as well, you know? Yes, understood. I definitely understand that. I'm gonna uh, shoot this question from the audience again. Um, and this is from Crystal. Thank you, Crystal. Um, to President Green and Ruby, have you interact, um, have your interactions with the prison correctional officers, wardens, et cetera, been positive or do you get pushback? And Ruby, ladies first. So President Green, let me let, let me let Ruby answer first. Okay. And I'm going to make this real, real short. Okay. Um, first of all, um, because I go to the facilities that I was also housed in, mm -hmm. my character already speaks for itself. Um, I was a, what they call a model prisoner. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was there for correcting my behavior, not for disrupting. So um, I, I, I taught <coughs> in uh, a PALS program, Principles and Applications for Life, which is a Christian base. So. Um, and I lived there until I, it was time for me to go to school because you can't go to school. I don't know how it is for you guys, Jill, but you, you, you can't start school until you're like three years outside of going home. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
uh, for four years, I had to find something to do, uh, basically. But uh, what I did was I went into a, 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 a program where I was actually a character coach. Um, and I was still able to teach other women how to be virtuous women. But um, the thing is, I believe that the wardens love me. Uh, I haven't had any problems uh, in the beginning. I'm not going to lie now. In the beginning, because when you first get out, uh, they have like a kind of a waiting period, I guess, to see if you're going to act up. But I promise you, as a formerly incarcerated person, if, and I told them this the first day I checked in, if y'all would have brought me to prison for a one day wonder, I would stop doing everything I was doing. Mm. That's how serious I was about seeing all that concrete and all that steel. Mm. And my whole thing, what I did was I hung out with lifers. Yeah. And a lot of people think that's strange, but I hung out with lifers, people who had long sentences, because I wanted to know how they were able to do. 15, 20, 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. and still stand strong. So those women helped me, like Shelly Ann Dana, who's now out, you know, uh, Willie Mae Harris, who just, you know, is getting ready to get out in like 30 days now. Uh, people, women with life, life sentences, they were actually my mentors. They, they're the ones that I said, look, how do you do time without the time doing you? And they were like, read do this, do this. And so I did, like I said, that goes again with this. I wasn't a good decision maker, you know, and, and I have to admit that to myself because if I was a good decision maker, I wouldn't have made the decision to sell drugs and not knowing that there were consequences behind that, mm -hmm. especially when you don't know the consequences, you know, and it was an era where I could have got a life sentence, but the, the guards, um, when I step on the compounds, they're like, Ruby, um, I have a good rapport uh, with ADC, ACC. Um, there's not too much I can't go to them and say, hey, look, uh, let's work together and let's do this because they look at the simple fact that if, it, if it's working for her, maybe it'll work for them. Awesome. We have a few more minutes. We're going to try to tie it up by eight. It's almost eight o'clock. It's about 8.05 maybe. Okay. So President Green, can you answer that question also? Do you encounter pushback from, you know, the prisons, wardens, directors, no. programs? No, no, we really don't uh, get pushback from the prisons. You, you have to, to, to realize that in order for us to be in the prison during this program, that that decision had to be made right. at the top. Uh, uh, this is something that the governor uh, blessed and the Department of Corrections itself, the Board of Corrections, mm -hmm. uh, had to make a decision uh, that they would embrace um, uh, uh, a partnership with a college to offer college within the uh, prison itself. So uh, from the very beginning, uh, there was agreement and buy-in uh, at the highest levels of uh, decision-making and authority in corrections in the state and, um, uh, and by the government. I mean, you simply cannot just decide that you're going to, to, <laughs> to, to go have college. Yeah. Inside of inside of prison. I mean, this, I mean, they they are prisons, and uh, when you get there, if you didn't appreciate it, you will appreciate it uh, after you get there. Uh, what we do run into sometimes, uh, and and especially at the beginning, is indifference. Uh, run into some indifference, and there are people. Uh, who work within the prison, uh, sometime at high levels, sometime at a low, at low levels, who have prejudices uh, that um, uh, you find uh, in the general community about uh, certain opportunities being afforded to persons who are incarcerated, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that they ought not to get that. Uh, uh, but I, I'm happy that the current public policy 
uh, in America today uh, is that uh, mass incarceration is not good. And uh, it is an amazing thing to me that both liberals and conservatives have both come to the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, obviously, they have different reasons, different rationales as to how they got to that point. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, they have. And so there is, there is, uh, is very strong support from uh, the right and from the left uh, to, re to solve this mass incarceration uh, and recidivism problem. Uh, it has been determined that it is bad for the economy, uh, that it is a loss of human resources, and that that is our greatest uh, resource and our greatest capital. So, uh, so initially, there is sometimes uh, some indifference, uh, but what prison officials see when these young men and women uh, become college people, they see that they are no longer the men and women that they had in custody uh, before they became college uh, mm -hmm. students. They have a new sense of self, a new identity. Uh, 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 disciplinary issues uh, go to almost zero because they do not want to lose uh, that opportunity. Uh, and of course, that was the situation in the movie, uh, in, the, in the documentary, where a couple of people got in trouble. And one situation in particular, where it was a bogus uh, 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 charge, uh, the young man was doing his homework. It had... Um, uh, right. harsh language mm -hmm. uh, in the literature that they were discussing. You can't do your homework uh, about literature that has negative language and you can't repeat the negative language uh, to talk about it. Uh, so I was very happy uh, yeah. that uh, to see that, that, uh, that he was exonerated mm -hmm. for that. But what this also brings up is there are uh, people at the prison guard level who sometimes envy uh, these young people who have more education than they do, uh, yeah. and, and and may have and may have possibilities that they don't have once they are released, and so right. you may have some uh, persecution. Mm -hmm. if you would. So that is something uh, that has to be looked out for. One of the things that we are looking at at Shorter College is developing a program to also provide college education for staff persons uh, yes. at the prison uh, oh. so that they too can get the benefit. They can become better employees uh, and, uh, and mm -hmm. they have no reason yeah. uh, to feel that uh, the inmates should not have this. Now, this is not something we've done, but this is certainly something that we're thinking about looking at. That would at be awesome. And that would be awesome. Yes, that would be awesome. Kwame said he's going to work with you <laughs> on that. <laughs> <laughs> Jewel, we saw you struggling with a little of that, and you spoke on it a little bit, I think, in in uh the documentary have you i know you what what is your experience with that type thing and, and president green touched on it with the jealousy or envy of the um you all students having maybe what they think the upper hand or maybe feel like that you think you're too smart mm -hmm. and they just don't like the fact that they didn't get that opportunity and you do have that opportunity? What What was your experience or have you had? My, my experience was that they were in the minority. There were a few officers who felt, you know, envious mm -hmm. and prejudicial 
However, the majority supported it for all the reasons that were spoken about, but one additional, mm -hmm. because they didn't have to worry about us. Yeah. We were more concerned with doing our work than getting in trouble. Yes. So they appreciated that, you know? There were times when officers actually said, leave those guys alone because all they're doing is studying. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about them stabbing, taking drugs, or doing anything illicit because they're more focused on their classes. So I had a few small incidents with officers, but I, I tell you, overall, the majority supported it. And I agree, you know, when I say that we think everyone should have access to education, yes. I'm everyone, officers as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Kwame has a question. Uh, with the Ford Foundation, um, what is this again? I'm sorry. Easing up their funding. Okay. Okay. Sorry. With the Ford <coughs> Foundation easing up their funding uh, funds and giving some to, are you asking a question? With Ford Foundation easing up funds, do you want them to give some to Shorter? Is that? <laughs> I think he's asking well, it. I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's asking if if uh the Ford it's foundation can uh slide funds down to shorter college now i wish <laughs> two things i want to i want to say about that one is i'm not an actual funder right. i do data analysis and strategy development mm -hmm. for the grant making so i don't have that funding decision making power but our strategy unfortunately isn't based on uh college education Right. We fund bail reform. Mm -hmm. We fund reentry support. You know, I'm I'm a little critical of my team about that, but there are reasons. We have a strategy that right. we follow that doesn't necessarily involve funding college and prison programs, unfortunately. Right. But I definitely love to look more into shorter and keep a connection because I hear I'm hearing great things about it. So yeah, please do, please do. We we really want you to. Um, we lost Ruby. And yeah. so, but it's getting, it's, uh, we got we're about 10 minutes uh, past eight. And so we want to respect everybody's time. Hopefully Ruby can pop back in. We're trying to contact her now, but if not, then um, we've heard so much, so many wonderful things from her that I think we, we got our pearls of wisdom and seeds. And also, that we can, uh, we have her information for anybody who wants to reach out to Ruby and connect with her again. And if I may say real quick, yes. Yes. one thing that I, I totally respect Ruby, we need to understand that the women experience of incarceration is totally different than men. And it's a bigger issue now because while there are more men incarcerated, mm -hmm. women are being incarcerated at a faster rate than yes. anyone in this nation now. And that's an atrocity. It really is. It seriously is. And so thank you for that, Jewel. Thank you for recognizing that. And what I want to do is I want to end with, we talk about um, preventative, you know, making preventative steps for our young people. We, Washita Foothills Youth Media Arts and Literacy is, is, is our nonprofit and we work with young people uh, with um, looking at the disparities in the community, um, trying to find solutions after a situation has happened, looking at those situations and, fig and trying to get them to figure out what could you have done to prevent that. Mm -hmm. uh, so they become a, they become this, um, a journalist of sorts that will, will dig into these situations and read about these issues and try to figure out how could we have, how could we prevent this, right? Along with the other things, they use their art form and everything to express themselves um, about issues and equality and equity. What would you tell young people? Is that Ruby? Hey, Ru Ruby, is that you? Okay. What would you tell young people, President Green, what would you tell them um, as a as a preventative measure to get them to understand that they don't have to that this program is for you if you happen to go 
but we want you to do everything that you can to to not have to sit in those seats or or be in incarcerated and go through um the system well we are mm -hmm. working on a partnership now uh with the north little rock school district and we will be implementing this fall uh dual enrollment and concurrent enrollment for high school students uh the the earlier that you can engage uh young people into the idea that continued education is relevant uh the greater likelihood that you can have that they will complete high school mm -hmm. that they will stay out of trouble and that they will move forward uh with continuing their education so uh it is a so it, it is a matter of access uh to not only education but to experiences that uh help them to understand that these subjects that you study have practical relevance. If, if they understood that mathematics has to do with making their cell phones work, if, if they understood that uh, science and technology is what makes the GPS in their car Mm -hmm. uh tell you how to find some place for mapping if, if if they can understand that uh that what makes the very computer game uh that they enjoy playing uh has to do with coding and mathematics when so it is it is a matter of of relevance uh uh for these young people uh because of they they look at what they think is immediate and 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 relevant yeah. and so they have to to be able to see that and they may not be able to get it from their parents uh and so the opportunity for them to get it from another source uh if it's not available in their home uh is is something that i think is is really important uh another thing that i think is really important is working on helping young parents be parents uh we need more courses on parenting yeah and uh and uh helping young families uh to real children to create the family uh that will give them self-esteem uh strong values uh the ability to make their own decisions rather than follow the herd so we, there's a, we have a lot of work uh to do uh but those are just some of the things that are some of my thoughts thank you thank you so much and i agree with them ruby because i want to end with you jewel ruby what <coughs> would be we talked about preventative measures and i know you talk with young people what are, what are some of the things you tell them that will help keep them or or that you've seen to help keep them on a, a path of okay maybe i don't want to go to college but i want to do a trade but i or i want to go to college uh and i don't want to go to to a prison or be incarcerated what are some of the things that you've done or said to young people to keep to keep them in that mind frame of, you know, I'm going to stay focused and and I'm going to stay I'm going to stay out of this. And free and, and one of the greatest things that I do educate um, a lot of my because I, I I I love I love our future I love our future yeah. and I hang out with them a lot. Yeah. Um, but I, I make sure that I let the young men and young women know that at the age of 16 in the state of arkansas you can actually start cosmetology or barber school and i give them the hope of look at the fact that, you know if you start at 16 when you're 17 you already have a profession yes 
you can work and send yourself to college. You know, you don't have to, you know, have to deal with the structures of the, the loans and the Pell Grants. And they're like, well, we never knew that. And so I just let them know things that people didn't educate me on because if I would have known that, um, well, a couple, a couple of things that I did know because I did start GoTech. Uh, when I was 15, like I said, I just, I went way off course because like I said, hurting people hurt people. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I just, I just speak to them from a transparency. You know, I don't, I don't lie to them. I I, I mean, I'm honest. I, I let them know, look, I, I tried cigarettes. I tried drinking. I tried partying. I did it all. But the thing about it is, if you realize right now, at the age of 15, 16, 17, 18, even 21. All of that is going to be there when you're 30. Mm -hmm. Get your education. Great. Get your education. Great. And then you're in control of every step of your life. Because one thing I know for a fact, and this is what my dad used to always tell all 10 of his kids, you can do whatever you want in this life, but all y'all going to graduate from high school. Because one thing about Life is education is something no one can take from you. That's right. Yes. And Thank so you. I mean, yes. and that's that's yes. what I tell them. Yes. Thank you so much, Jewel. Thank you. I appreciate you. So You're much. welcome. I, I wanted to say this though, Ruby. You said hurting people hurt people, but the wise woman once told me that hurt people heal people too. Mm -hmm. Hurting people can heal but, people too. But once, yeah, that's true. But see. And, and that's that's why why I found my freedom in prison. Yeah. Because it was in prison, and and I don't know if you my first sp speech was talking about healing while being yes. held hostage. Yeah. You know, and that's where the healing began. Where I began to talk to my spiritual being. My my everybody calls me a nit, but I went back to what I was called as a young girl, Ruby. Yeah. And so I, I started talking to the Ruby in me, the Ruby mm -hmm. that had ideas. The Ruby had, that had great expectations. And, and that's where I learned how to heal me. Yes. But I tell everyone, you can't heal anyone mm -hmm. until you heal first. That's right. So that's why I said hurting people hurt people. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the women mm -hmm. and the men that are incarcerated, you know, it's some pain going on. Yes. But do yes. you choose, do you choose as a human being to 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 give enough time to value them enough that you choose to find out what that pain actually is and you help them heal once you heal thank you because we've got we've got officers and wardens and police out let's remember all of that we've got people with all kind of initials behind the, their names that just because right. you ain't never been in prison, yeah that doesn't mean that you're free that's right absolutely we're seeing that right now we've we've seen that for a long time Long time. Thank you so much. Jewel, you have the last word. Well, I like to, <laughs> speaking in reference to the youth, I like to meet the youth where they're at. Uh, you know, I think that our, this generation that we have now is really unique. You know, I, I know it's easy to say that, you know, I was young and I know what you were going through, but I don't think many, many of our experience could relate to what you foresee now, you know? So I, I really wanna, I, I, I work to do this because I think, you know, talking to them is one thing, but showing them is another, you know? So I try to meet them where they at and show them what's, what's going on, how I'm, I'm, where I came from, how I engage things. But I think it's important to meet them where they at. I don't like trap music, but I listen to it because yeah. I know the way to talk to the youth. You know? So, uh, you know, I try to meet them where they're at yeah. to, to, cause I think there's a way in our societies if I just really quickly, we don't treat the youth as people. We treat them as something other than a person. That's right. You try to talk to them. That's the way you talk to them straight. Yeah. Treat them as human beings. Don't try to hide stuff from them, mm -hmm. but also show them and meet them where they're at. That's yeah. what they're at. They, you know, the young people, especially in our community, have a saying where they say to each other, you know, I see you, mm. I see you. They're recognizing and, and they're connecting with one another to let them know, you know, you're not invisible, like I see you. So they use those terms and they, they want us to see them. 
and we we do have to talk to them and they're not and i always say this in groups and different chats and different things with people who are trying to do youth projects that our young people are more resilient than we give them credit for they are already having these yeah. conversations they're already having these hard very hard experiences where they live so we can't be tiptoeing around subjects and different things and life issues with them um we stand to learn a lot from what they've gone through because we hadn't gone through everything and everybody's experience is different so yeah treating them with respect and and i don't i cringe when i hear people say i want to give the youth the voice well they already have a voice and our our saying is they have a voice they come with one and all we do is provide tools to help them express themselves you know in a way that they otherwise wouldn't be able to express themselves so what i want to say is thank you all so very much i thank you for just taking this time out this very crucial time to have this conversation ruby we love you we honor you we appreciate you thank you so much keep doing the work yes thank you so much if you need anything please let us know we got you just let us know. President Green, we love you. We honor you. We thank you for the work that you've done. You already have a team member with Kwame. Kwame is ready to work. So I'm going to have him call you too. Um, Absolutely. Yes. And keep keep doing what you're doing. Thank you for taking Shorter College and, and just in building um, that historical college. Thank you so much for the work that you've done. Jewel Hall, yeah. my brother. Thank you. Thank you, man. We love you. We honor you, and we really appreciate the, you know, just your experience, and also your success, and what you're doing right now, and um, keep doing it. Can some President Green, will you say yes. uh, just a little short prayer for for? us and, and everybody like a communal like just the community prayer for what's happening right now and how we can just kind of you know what i mean move uh, I, i'd be glad to and, and before i do let me yes. just uh say how much i admire jewel and yes. uh, how much i appreciate uh him for what he's done uh, for overcoming uh challenges and for being an exemplary role model uh because in this work there is no substitute for an example of what it is that we're trying to accomplish by by providing uh a college education to persons who have been incarcerated mm -hmm. uh there are people who are skeptical and who have doubts and so when the gatekeepers and decision makers in society have an opportunity to see a jewel uh then they understand mm -hmm. uh that uh, uh what we're trying to do and that it can be done because uh because the stereotypes have to be uh destroyed mm -hmm. uh and uh, persons who have been incarcerated have to be seen as thinking social human beings uh Dang. just like everybody else just like everybody else uh, and uh and he does that so well so thank you thank you thank you for that now let let us pray uh heavenly father we uh thank you for being god and we recognize that you are the great i am uh, and that uh, all power is in your hand and so father we ask that you would now uh bless uh your people father we ask that you would go with clarice and her work and her missions with ruby uh with jewel with anika with all persons of goodwill who want to make the world a better place. Father, we ask that you would give guidance and change the hearts of those persons who would hate and who would do negative things. Uh, 
we ask that you would help America see that all lives really do matter and that every life is precious uh, in your sight. Father, we ask that you would heal this land because you said that if my people uh, will turn from their wicked ways, those who are called by my name, uh, then uh, I will heal from heaven and heal the land. And so, Father, we claim the healing uh, in America and in our communities uh, today. Uh, in the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Joy, uh, we have a we want we have a person on in the audience who wants Jules' autograph. <laughs> <laughs> uh, President, uh, so distancing. Huh? Say social distancing. I think she's gonna mail some to you. You can write it and then you just mail it back. But we're gonna give give her your. I don't know if you want to provide your um address to me via email i'll be happy to give it just to her if you okay. want to do that okay because sure. i think she was a per she was a one of the people who would wanted some of your writings and work okay so president green black yeah. lives matter <laughs> yes they do black lives matter. let me tell you black lives matter somebody got toe up about that all my black lives black matter. matter now wait i'm just gonna say black they black do matter. They do, we know that. But but yeah. right now in this country, in this country. <laughs> this time, Black Lives Matter. Black, black lives. lives. I need you to black say that when you, you go to a protest. Don't say no prayer like that. They're gonna tear you up, President Green. I'm just saying. <laughs> if you say no, I want I'm like, Ruby, I'm saying it. <laughs> Jewel, <laughs> Jewel, help it. I'm just saying. Okay, we love you. I said, Jewel, if you're in New York, you see Donna Hilton, give That's her a hug for me. She'll know who you're talking about. Yes, I will. I love Donna. She's great. And we are holding space for Black Wall Street, Tulsa.